it is obviously very, very important not only to deliver life-saving resuscitation in those patients who have suddenly had cardiac arrest, but to make sure that we um, don't give any treatments, resuscitation and other invasive treatments, to those who don't want them. Um, show of hands, how many people have seen a patient who has had treatments that they probably haven't benefited from, who, had they been given the opportunity, would have said they didn't want them? So this is important. <laughs> okay, but I'm sorry it's not as upbeat as the previous talks. Um, so the very first two or three slides are revision because uh, the Recess Council very kindly invited me to talk here three years ago and I talked about the problems with DNA CPR and I'm sure some of you were there and so I apologise for three slides of revision but some of you won't have been and so I feel I just need a very brief summary of where we're coming from. So I always say that the resuscitation acronym was the acronym which loved to get longer. So we started with DNR, do not resuscitate, really clear that some patients shouldn't have CPR attempted on them. But then, and we had reference to media earlier on, um, I think everyone knows probably that media portrayals show 60% in hospital survival from CPR. So A was added in order to kind of let the public know that DNA, CPR, uh, DNAR, uh, we were only attempting it and might not be successful. And then there were concerns that, um, public, that, that health professionals might think that it was do not attempt fluid resuscitation or sepsis resuscitation. So two more letters were added and we got to DNA CPR. And if we keep going at this rate, we get <laughs> DNA rutiara warakra outsbaga, which is do not attempt resuscitation unless there is a clear shockable rhythm uh, with a reversible cause, all other treatments should be given. And that's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> so... We needed a different approach. And um, this talk is, is perhaps a little bit less scientific than, well, it is less scientific than the one I gave three years ago where I went through all the evidence. But, but in summary, there are or were a few issues with DNA CPR. So the first is they weren't routinely completed. So there was a lot of variation, not only among hospitals, but among wards and even among individual clinicians on the same ward. As a result of that, patients were left inappropriately for CPR, and the NCPOD report in 2012 showed that we still, unfortunately, had a lot of inappropriate resuscitation attempts, even on patients who were on the now-deceased Liverpool care pathway. Um, nobody liked discussing CPR, so patients didn't like it, doctors didn't like it, and as a result, people didn't, and um, pre the Tracy case, only 50% of uh, do not resuscitate decisions were discussed with patients. Everyone is familiar that in um, 2014, the uh, Court of Appeal ruled that it was against a patient's human rights not to discuss resuscitation with the patient. Following that, there was the Winspear case saying that we must take any practicable and appropriate steps, uh, contact relatives where practical and appropriate. The fourth problem, and the one that really bothered me as a registrar training was that DNA CPR could be misunderstood to mean that other treatments shouldn't be given. Do not resuscitate was um, conflated with about to die. And as a result of that, um, uh, there was a difference in care. So nurses were less likely to escalate up to doctors. Doctors were less likely to come to the patients. Doctors were less likely to give even simple treatments like anticoagulation and echoes for a patient in heart failure and um, patients were less likely to be admitted to ICU. And there was an associated mortality, and a lot of these were matched studies for comorbidity. And finally, there was huge variation in approach with multiple, and still is, with multiple different forms in multiple different places. So, what were we going to do about all these problems? And this is um, a slide that I just want to take a, a minute with, because I strongly believed, and we published lots of work, and, and Gavin Perkins led an evidence synthesis in, in Warwick, and there's various other international work, that all of this evidence, but most particularly around the idea that DNA CPR was being understood to mean that patients were dying, that they shouldn't get the same level of care. I'm not talking about patients who were dying and where the main aim was to make sure they were comfortable. I'm talking about the 92-year-old lady, which was actually one of my patients, 92-year-old lady with pneumonia, who came in on a Friday night, who was completely independent, but was very frail, almost certainly wouldn't have survived CPR, but could absolutely be given antibiotics and perhaps a brief trial of um, intubation and ventilation while the antibiotics worked if she wasn't responding fast enough. How do you communicate that over six handovers um, over a weekend? So I think there was an ethical imperative to stop using DNA CPR, but what were we going to replace it with and how are we going to test it? 
So the development of respect, I think probably some of you will know something about. There were stakeholders from 37 different patient and clinical groups. We uh, reviewed evidence both nationally and internationally in their systematic reviews published. Some of the best practice exemplars were UFDO, TEP, Deciding Right, Unwell Patient, and in the States, Pulsed and Canada Most. We had an iterative development. We had a public consultation for which we're very grateful. I think a lot of you responded. Um, there were lots of suggestions made. 91% of people agreed with the overall principle. And the overall principle was that resuscitation decisions shouldn't be considered on its own. It should be considered in the context of overall treatment plans, and we should be recording when someone should be for resuscitation as well as when someone shouldn't be. We did usability testing. We had further iterations. We did more usability testing. And um, we have an NIHR grant, led again by Gavin, to evaluate the outcome in early adopter sites. So where did we get to? Well, we got to a very, very different form than a DNA CPR form. But it stands for the Recommended Summary Plan for Emergency Care and Treatment. Every single word means something for this plan. So the idea is that, first of all, you start off with a shared understanding of the current situation. You ask the patient in this first bit that you're filling in, you make sure that you both understand what their major conditions are, what their limitations are, and then you go on to talk about their preferred outcomes. Um, in terms of preferred outcomes, we have, that, we have a scale, and this is taken from the BMJ article from earlier this year. Um, the idea of the scale isn't necessarily that someone has to tick it all the time. It's a tool to be able to help having a conversation with a patient about where they are. You could say some patients feel strongly that they want life preservation at all costs. Other people want comfort at all costs. Most people are somewhere in between. Where, where do you think you are? Um, and from that, you can then go on to talk about what outcomes are most valued and when I ask this to patients, particularly elderly patients who have been, who are still independent and who have managed to lead long and healthy lives, I consistently get the answer, I have led a good and healthy life. When my time comes, I want to go quickly. I do not want a lingering death or I do not want to end up in a dependent state. That's the kind of thing that then can then, then help the clinician make clinical recommendations. So based on the outcomes that you know the patient wants, you can then say, in the context of that, this is what I think would be most appropriate. We will give you all the treatments, and so the conversation becomes a little bit easier than just, by the way, we're not going to try and restart your heart. It's talking about how we will give you treatments to make sure that we maintain those outcomes and we ensure a good quality of life. And in the context of all of those things, the CPR decision is almost a footnote because you've talked through how you're going to get to all of the rest of the treatments. And I think part of the problem with the red DNA CPR form and actually part of the problem with the Tracy tr judgment and all the rest of the legal documentation is that CPR has become a separate thing. And it is actually part of a medical treatment in most patients, not obviously someone who suddenly goes into ventricular fibrillation out of hospital, but in most patients who are dying in hospital they're di or, or at home, they're dying from another condition of which their heart stopping is the final step. So, in order to go from red DNA CPR to respect, what's needed? Well, it is an absolute culture change. It's a culture change from us, and it's a culture change from members of the public, and it's not just another lengthening of the acronym. It can be for anybody. There's been still misunderstanding that respect might just be for those approaching the end of life. Well, of course, it is important for those approaching the end of life. They absolutely need to think about it, but you can think about it before. And I have argued a little bit, it's like the Stoic philosophers. So the Stoic philosophers used to think that in order to do well in battle, they had to imagine themselves in the worst possible situation. That's where the word Stoicism comes from. They had to imagine someone charging at them. And if they'd done that, then when they were in that situation, they were more able to deal with that. Well, if you have a conversation with someone about respect before you become really ill, then even if that set of decisions you make then isn't the same set of decisions you think about when you're really ill, at least you've already thought about it and you can revise them. If you haven't thought about it ever before, the chances of being able to have a calm, considered conversation are much less. So although it is for those approaching the end of life, we're really trying to encourage a culture change where this gets considered early and um, certainly in those complex comorbidities. Obviously, if someone comes in in an emergency situation, you can fill it in then, but we'd like it to be filled in early. And at our recent strategic steering group meeting, we were talking about how it fits in with advanced care planning and with um, the AMBA care pathway and with all kinds of other excellent initiatives which are also designed to make sure patients get the right treatment at the right time. And someone came up with the analogy 
of a thread going through all of this. It's not replacing anything else, but it's something that can go from the first point that you want it all the way through primary care, secondary care, um, hospice, nursing home, and it can, it can weave through other initiatives that are going on, but it will be, the, the goal is that it will be recognisable and um, transferable. I did want a beautiful um, slide for that, but I totally failed to create it, so I'm hoping you can all imagine my thread as I do that. So, that's the past. Where, where are we at now? Well, as I hope you know, um, the respectprocess.org.uk website launched uh, in February of this year, and um, on it there are educational materials, there are some videos of some patients and relatives talking about wh wh what they valued in it, um, and there's some FAQs and lots of other resources. Um, there were two BMJ articles published to time with that, uh, which really summarise the evidence and summarise some suggestions we have on um, how we should talk about CPR. And then in April of this year, um, there was a learning app launched, which can be downloaded from the website, um, and which talks through, has, has learning modules, uh, which we would hope that clinicians would use when, when respect is being instigated. Um, we, we know that we had a tricky time in communicating with people between uh, the launch in February and sometime later, and apologies for that. We had difficulties for all kinds of reasons, not least the huge amount of interest that we didn't quite realise would come so quickly. But we were very, very fortunate in appointing Catherine Baldock as a respect manager, and she started in September. And um, she has totally taken on making sure that implementation packs are distributed to more than the 150 interested sites, providing support and outreach to sites. And she and uh, either David or I will be at the respect... Um, stand in the hall for anyone who has questions for us later on. <clears throat> so what is the process of adoption? Out of curiosity, uh, how many people here have, have looked at or thought about implementing respect? And, and I won't come out with a shotgun. How many people absolutely want nothing to do with it, truthfully? I'm quite happy to, okay. Either people are really scared of me or... <laughs> I don't know. But um, so in order to go through the process of adoption, um, there is a responsibilities and requirement document which needs to be signed, which basically goes through the kind of things that your healthcare environment needs to be ready for before you take on respect. Things like governance, things like saying you'll have um, continued feedback. And obviously, in order to take it on, there needs to be education across all healthcare settings. It might be starting in a hospital. That's what we've seen happen so far. So it might start in a hospital, but for it to start in the hospital, you need to have educated your ambulance care trusts. You need to have educated your nursing homes and your primary care trusts, at least to recognise it. And the pattern that we've been seeing and that we think is reasonable is you probably start off with a hospital replacing their DNA CPR with respect. So to start off with, we've seen even though respect should be for those people who are for resuscitation as well. You can imagine when the change happens, it seems to be initially that it's just replacing the DNA CPRs, then going out into the community, then starting to come back in. And what we anticipate happening kind of organically is once we have enough knowledge in the healthcare community, we'll start a public campaign to get the public interested in completing their respect form with clinicians. And then we will find that more and more patients have it who want treatments as we want CPR and other treatments as well coming back in, so it will become a broader thing. In terms of where we're at right now, fully adopted is the Coventry and um, Warwickshire healthcare community, which includes UHCW, I won't read all of the italics, Heart of England, um, Manchester Central, and North and Mid Hampshires. There are nine trusts and there are associated healthcare communities with explicit go live dates all planned fairly early in 2018. 23 other trusts that we know are in the process of planning implementation, more than 70 others considering, and um, nine uh, have, have told us they're not interested in doing it right now for, for interesting reasons and absolutely welcome. I think I just want to emphasise what we're doing is saying there is an ethical imperative to change from DNA CPR. This is the best we can do at the moment based on good evidence. It is an iterative process. We need continued feedback. We're going to have the outcome of a full evaluation from these early adopter sites in two and a half, three years. Um, and at, th at that point, we will have a body of evidence, but we feel that making this available to people was ethically required. And so I just want to emphasize that feedback is, is absolutely essential, because without the feedback, uh, we can't continue to iterate it. So here are the challenges that we've had to date from those early implementers. 
The first was section six, which is the discussion section where you had to tick A or B or C depending on capacity. And um, we have simplified that over the last couple of months based on feedback, and we've had it approved by mental capacity lawyers both in England and Scotland, because part of the difficulty is there's different law there. The patient information leaflet, you told us, was too long and too cumbersome, and so it's been simplified down to 1.5 pages and should be available very soon. We are in the process of creating an audit tool, which again should be available January. Um, and then the biggest challenge is digital. So, a word on digital. Ideally, we would like a universally accessible, smartphone-friendly, intuitive digital solution that interfaces with primary and secondary care and ambulance crews and hospices and care homes and can be printable so the patient can have a copy at home, which somehow links to and updates the electronic version so we don't have version control. No problem. The problem is, obviously, the NHS is not digitally integrated and there is not a simple solution. Um, so, we have three stages of development planned, and I think I should acknowledge that a lot of people have complained or reasonably said, why did you present this without a digital solution? And the answer is, a lot of places were just using paper DNA CPRs, and a paper respect form we thought was better than a paper DNA CPR, and the next stage is to create a digital solution. So, the first thing is a writable PDF, which will be available early in 2018. That is almost done. The second is a standard template, which is a a digital archetype for healthcare software engineers, and that's being developed so that there is that, that can then be integrated into lots of other systems. But again, to emphasize, there isn't great interoperability between NHS systems, so, but if we can create a digital archetype. Now, the Nirvana is uh, to establish a hosted service for respect data, and that would then prevent, potentially provide access to respect from any EPR system. Um, uh, but because there's a contained, discrete data set for respect, we actually may be able to be pioneers in the NHS in terms of an electronic approach, and we're quite optimistic about it. We've had a lot of support from various different organizations. So we've always been optimistic, but we continue to be. So what's next? Um, very, we are very grateful. We, we, all of the community that has been working on DNA CPR and respect and everything else are incredibly grateful to the Resource Council UK, who, um, in fact, I think I phoned David Pitcher like eight years ago, talking to him about this when I wasn't a member of Recess well, I don't think I was even a member of the Recess Council UK, to be truthful. And um, at that point, uh, they, they, they started supporting us, and this has gone from strength to strength. And as Federico mentioned, um, as, as no, Andy mentioned this morning, um, respect is one of the things that uh, Recess Council UK are now planning to invest as kind of part of their strategic plan. As part of that, we're going to build an electronic implementation network that shouldn't say January 2019, sorry, January 2018. And the idea is that people then, early implementers and um, people who are interested would be able to have an online community to discuss what's going on, um, share resources. Uh, we're forming an education subgroup to develop further education materials for both the general public and healthcare professionals, including a standalone open access module on the respect process to fit in with ALS and ILS and so on and so forth. But it would be on the Resource Council um, webpage. And we're planning a, a, workshop, a series of seminars and workshops in April of next year to share learning from the early implementers. So they've all said they will come and talk about how they managed to implement it and discuss future development. So we're envisaging having workshops on education, workshops on a digital solution, workshops so that we can learn from everybody. And we'd be very grateful if, if lots of you came. So... Respect is uh, a dynamic process. I've said it was developed in response to evidence problems with DNA CPR. It is absolutely driven by a desire to provide better care for our patients, and it is absolutely dependent on continued engagement and feedback from those who are using it. So please join the implementation network when it's up and running, come to the meeting in April, email us, and feel free to ask questions today. Thank you very much.